Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Our next speaker is Bit Minoyan. She is the author of the memoir, Stealing Buddha's Dinner, which received the Penn Gerard Award, and also of the novel, Short Girls, which received an American Book Award. She's also co-edited three anthologies with Pearson Longman, The Contemporary American Short Story, Contemporary Creative Nonfiction, I and I, and 3030, 30 American Stories from the Last 30 Years. She is currently a professor of literature and creative writing at Purdue University. Her session today is entitled The Need for Creative Writing, in which she'll focus on her experiences as both a writer and a professor of creative writing, the role of creativity, the importance of the creative writing classroom, and why students need the literary arts in their lives. Bit, are you ready to begin? Ready. Okay, thank you. Okay, here we are. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to this conference. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak with you all, even if I can't see you and you can't see me. I do have a few PowerPoint slides here to add some visual interest, and as Amy said, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have here or later over email. My talk is titled The Need for Creative Writing, and it's based on my perspectives as both a pr practicing writer and a professor of creative writing at Purdue University. I wanted to start, though, with a little bit of background on how I came to all of this. When my family and I arrived in the United States in 1975, I was eight months old, and we were refugees who had fled Vietnam the night before the fall of Saigon. We found ourselves settling in suburban Grand Rapids, Michigan, see the orange arrow, which was a mostly white conservative town on the west side of the state. I grew up in a household in which Vietnamese and English were spoken, sometimes Spanish as well, because my stepmother is Mexican-American, so there was a lot of cultural mix and confusion. And I ended up learning a lot of the basics of American English through television, you know, learning slang, learning grammar and syntax. But then I learned to read. And thanks to the children's books that my older siblings had and the library, books became everything to me. They became an escape. They became a way to learn about characters, language, worlds beyond my own. And they became a central focus of my life. I began to measure the days by library visits, a habit that started before kindergarten and continued through college. Saul Bellow said that writers are readers moved to emulation. And that was definitely the case for me growing up in a mostly white town in the 1980s, which was there a time before diversity and multiculturalism. I was keenly conscious of appearing different or foreign, and I was such a shy student that the very thought of getting called on in class would be enough to make me try to fake being sick so I could stay home. There's no wonder then that books became my constant companions. I was lucky enough to have teachers who encouraged me to read independently, and lucky to have libraries nearby that were funded and open. Each year from first to sixth grade, the RIF organization, Reading is Fundamental, brought in piles of books and allowed every student to choose one for free. I treasured these books, and I still have them because they were mine to keep and to read over and over again. They were the imagination made real, and they encouraged me toward a lifetime of loving books and wanting to write them myself. Yet that desire to emulate, to write, would have remained secret or repressed had I not enrolled in creative writing classes in college. There I learned how to examine stories in terms of technique. I learned how to take and process criticism through a workshop. I learned about a whole new range of contemporary authors, and I learned how to locate the stories that most need to be told. I tell you all this to give you a personal example of how and why the creative world can matter. Because more and more, it seems, all of us in the arts and humanities have to justify to students, administrators, friends, family, people on airplanes, the existence and continuation of what we do and teach. I would say that two of the questions 
I am most often asked are, how does someone become a writer? And can writing be taught? The first question is virtually unanswerable. Who knows what strange mixture of events and feelings, discipline and temperament go into the making of a writer? It's hard to predict and impossible to duplicate or force. The second question is a lot easier. To me, the answer is yes. While I don't think anyone can be taught to be a writer, I absolutely do believe it's possible to teach students how to write and write better. Writing can be taught in the same way music can be taught, through practice and through stellar examples. We teach students how to describe through imagery and specificity, how to balance dialogue with exposition, how to create a story arc from instigating event to conflict to resolution, how the elements of fiction of craft function like hidden gears within a story or like the moving parts of a wristwatch. Character may be the center wheel, plot, the hour wheel, language, the minute wheel, and landscape, the balance wheel. Each story ticks along to its own cadence, and the whole apparatus exists within a singular casing of form and style of a piece and interconnected of its time and timeless, a closed system that contains open questions. When I teach, I always wonder if one or more of my students will go on to become writers. I always hope so, but I am under no illusion that the majority of students will or even should. Students take career writing reasons for career writing classes for a variety of reasons. Some do want to be writers. Some are interested in general self-expression. Some are looking for a creative outlet, and some think it's just an easy course, which they soon find out is not the case. All the students, regardless of their reasons, soon discover the same thing, that writing is a discipline. There is a reason we talk about craft in terms of work, because it is. Coming up with storylines, developing complex characters, finding just the right words and descriptions to make our stories and poems distinctive, image-driven, and fresh. These are not easy tasks. Sure, they sometimes emerge from bursts of inspiration, but far, far more often, they happen out of sheer effort, sitting down at the desk, and staying there, revising, persisting, and a great deal of reading. Here's where I want to reference the great Ron Carlson rule about writing from his book, Ron Carlson Writes a Story. He says, you have to stay in your chair and write, truly write. No emails, calls, inter no interruptions for at least 20 minutes. If you get to that 20 minute point and you're truly writing, most likely you're going to stay in your chair and keep writing something good. The amazing thing to me is that students learn how difficult writing is. They learn all of this in their introductory courses, and yet they keep going. At Purdue, where I teach fiction and nonfiction writing, our undergraduate creative writing program has grown so much that there are wait lists for every creative writing course, especially at the advanced. Nationally, creative writing has never been more popular. According to AWP, the Association for Writers and Writing Programs, BAs or BFAs in creative writing are offered at 157 different universities and colleges. On the graduate level, there are now 184 MFA programs in creative writing, which is a nearly 300% increase from 15 years ago. And getting into them becomes more and more competitive every year. At Purdue, applications to our MFA program have skyrocketed so that our acceptance rate for four fiction writers and four poets every year we have a three-year fully funded program. Our acceptance rate is around 4%. So I wonder, why are all these students, graduate and undergraduates, so eager to take creative writing? And as writing instructors, what can we offer them? And what is our responsibility to them? In view, creative writing courses, particularly at the undergraduate level, are not necessarily about turning students into writers. Indeed, I try to be clear with students about the harsh and often depressing realities of the writing life, what with all the rejection and likely lack of income and lack of societal support that goes along with it. The person who wants to write must, after all, possess his or her own self-motivation. A career writing course cannot provide that. Writing courses can provide, instead, the tools and techniques toward underwrite. They provide glimpses of possibility, a haven for community, a way to understand the building blocks of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry from the shape of a line to the quirks of character. 
and an introduction to a wide range of literature. As instructors, we can keep students immersed, even if only for a semester, but with any hope far beyond that in the life of the imagination. So while I do believe that good writing can be taught, I also think that creative writing classes are more about teaching students how to be readers, how to be thinkers, how to be engaged participants in the world. They are about giving students the ability to construct narrative and articulate ideas. Because writing begins long before we sit down to the blank page or the blank computer screen. It begins in reading. It begins not in our own words, but in others. Ian McEwen said that imagining what it is like to be someone other than yourself is at the core of our humanity. It is the essence of compassion, and it is the beginning of morality. Now, this sounds pretty lofty, but I truly do believe that he's getting at the heart of why creative writing will always matter as an art, as a discipline, and as something personal. When we read good fiction and nonfiction, we can't help but imagine what it's like to live another life to be somebody else. When we write, we're doing the same thing, whether through a made-up character or through our own past remembered selves. And through this act of imagination, we step outside ourselves a little. We expand our capacity for negative capability. And we become, I like to think, better people, made a little more complex. Here is another quote I love from the poet C. Day Lewis. We do not write in order to be understood. We write in order to understand. For me, growing up, books and writing presented an escape from the everyday world of family arguments, childhood angst, and just plain boredom. I read everywhere, on the bus, at the dinner table, while watching TV, and I took a book with me everywhere, even to the grocery store. Reading was a way for me to be alone, but not alone, because I had my favorite characters to keep me company. Their lives, like Joe March, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Elizabeth Bennet, were wildly different from my own, and I coveted their lives and everything they got to eat and wear. But they seemed so real to me, and in their realness, their sorrows, big and small, I began to learn something about acceptance and something about writing and creating. I might have thought of books as an escape, but really they were a portal to understanding the twists and turns of relationships, emotion, and desire. Because as every writer and writing instructor knows, characters must always desire something. The stakes seem even higher now in the age of Twitter, Facebook, and the constant updating news feed. When so much text is fragmented and aphoristic, bits and pieces of information coming at us in relentless real time. In a way, the act of creative writing is the act of slowing down and changing time, managing it, making sense of it. In writing, we get to bring shape to our lives. We get to find stories out of randomness. We get to craft meaning out of a lot of babble and detritus. Where the news feed never ends, the story, poem, or memoir must, inevitably, contain our vision of what might be a beginning, a middle, and an end. And through this kind of envisioning, we gain a sense of cohesion and clarity. The creative writing classroom is also about access. When I grew up, which was in that golden pre-internet age of the 1980s, my access began in libraries, and books were there for me in a way that television and games and all the media distractions we have now could not be. I could carry home as many books as I could hold, and I could know that I was learning secrets about the universe. Even though I never read a single book about or by an Asian American, I didn't even know they existed until I got to college, the books I loved illuminated something very true and real about my own family our identity experiences, our many dysfunctions, silences, and miscommunications. My life could not have been more different from Joe March's, but still I found something of myself in her and in the world Elcott created. Even better access came through the literature and creative writing classes I took in high school and college. My teachers and professors were curators and guides, showing me writers, books, and ideas that I never would have found on my own. These classes also provided access to fellow wannabe writers and to a real realm in which writing was respected and taken seriously. I think this is more important now than ever, though I still love the solitude of reading and writing, and I appreciate the ease and connectedness that online venues provide. 
the physical space of the writing classroom and the exchange of discussion and energy it allows cannot really be replaced. When I teach now, I try to remember the importance of this creative space. My goals are to keep the students involved, keep them reading and talking to each other about a diverse range of literature, keep them imagining what it is like to be someone else, and keep them writing about all of it. The creative writing classroom becomes a place for work, discipline, and also permission, discovering what can be done. I often ask my students what they read in high school, in middle school. What I'm really asking is, how have the books you've read shaped who you are now? And what I'm thinking is, which books and stories and poems might shape your futures? Which texts will end up serving as guideposts, eye-openers, ways to keep figuring out what can be said, felt, or written? While I do think that any kind of reading is good, I think it's especially important to read well. To me, it's like eating. The better we eat and the more we know about what we're eating, the better off we become. When I was a kid, I loved processed junk food. The more sugary and fake, the better. Bring on the cheetahs and the ho-hos. Today, I wouldn't eat them even if they were free for the taking because they just don't taste good anymore. They taste like artifice. This is a better palate that I'm glad to have, but it involved plenty of time and, in a sense, training. The same thing happens for the palates involved in reading and writing. The palate simply needs guidance. So the student who starts out admiring the Twilight books might end up loving work by A.S. Byatt, Elizabeth Costova, or Karen Russell. The student whose favorite book is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy might end up going for Margaret Atwood, George Saunders, Amy Bender. In terms of getting students writing, it's all about honing in on the specific, steering them toward the ability, as Blake said, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. It's a wonderful and strange paradox that the universal appears not through the general and abstract, but through the particular and concrete. It's also why the act and effort of writing, a fresh metaphor, or image, or description, is essentially an act of innovation which is probably why stories like Fiesta 1980 by Gina Diaz or story cycles like Olive Kittredge by Elizabeth Strout, filled with vivid, haunting descriptions and the minute particulars of characters, secrets, flaws, and interactions, always end up resonating with students, showing them how to, de to develop stories from the foundation of language, voice, and detail. After all, reading, unlike watching media, requires our active participation. It involves imagining, visualizing, and thus creating. The process of writing is nearly the same. If we were to ask students just to start writing, they would go blank. I go blank. But if we ask them to write something more directed, such as describe a day at the worst job you've ever had, or describe the strangest person in your neighborhood where you grew up, then they have a place to begin writing, which is to say a place to begin interpreting experience and observation. Reading directed literature, along with all this, continues the way forward and outward. For me, without all the cultural confusion I experienced growing up, I probably never would have become a writer. That is true, which is why I never know when I teach who's going to become a writer and who will not. But just as true is that I never would have written anything at all or even thought about it without the books that I read, everything from Little Women, to The Grapes of Wrath, to Madame Bovary, to Mrs. Bridge, to the many short stories and poems I read, discussed, and loved in the creative writing classes I took in college. Creative writing does so much more than provide a place for students to express their thoughts. It can show them ideas and experiences beyond their own and illuminate the way to their own necessary stories. It can help students and all of us reclaim, reorder, reshape, and understand more possible worlds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bit. I was wondering, as you were talking, um, what do you do with your own work in uh, in your teaching? Do you do you introduce your work um, to students? Do you ever write with 
students and do the exercises with them, or how do you position yourself in the classroom? I often do, when I assign writing exercises in class, I often do them along with the students because it's, it's fun. I actually love doing writing exercises just in general because I never know what's going to emerge from them. And, and uh, it's like having a deadline. So I, I do That's like to true. participate along with my along with my students, and it shows them also. I hope it shows them that we're all we're always needing writing exercises. We're always needing another way to mm -hmm. gain inspiration or to gain ideas. The ideas don't necessarily just come to us, you know, out of nowhere. That we have to actively go out and get them. And exercises are a good way to do that. Yeah, so it's also a way to kind of demystify the writing, uh, you know, demystify the writer and, and get students to see that writers are people who write. So it's not like some special breed, but, you know, people who sit down and, and actually do the work of it. Right. I think that sometimes it, when we read a book, it can seem such, uh, such, like, like such a text that was created. And... Mm -hmm. It's, it's a far away process from the actual writing itself. And so it, it seems mm -hmm. really, it can seem like a really easy thing. This book is so, I love this book, it's so beautifully written. But we don't necessarily know how, how, much, um, how much anxiety and time goes into every single word or every single use of punctuation. And mm -hmm. so getting students into, into that, to that point where they're you know, practicing the writing and then reading at the same time gets them to see the relationship between you know, the writing process and the reading process, which are completely different and yet you know, inextricable. Exactly. You know, the Im influence of, of um, books you read on your becoming um, you know, a creative thinker and, and later a writer and um, and you mentioned in your slide about, you know, what we can do in teacher creative writing, um, that, you know, one of the kind of the purposes is to introduce students to a wide um, range of, of literature. And I was kind of wondering, like, kind of from a nuts and bolts sort of way, when you, um, you know, how do you go about putting together um, a reading list um, for the class? What are some of the, some of the things you think about when you're um, assigning readings to the class? The reading list is is definitely something I, I put a lot of thought and worry into because I do want the reading list to be diverse enough. And I, when we talk about diversity, I, I mean diverse not just in terms of race and gender, but geography, subject matter, time period, uh, genre, so that students are getting a, a variety of perspectives on, you know, quote-unquote reality. So a story by George Saunders or Amy Bender that may not be as you know realistic as a story at, by you know Raymond Carver. Those two can go along really well together because students can see you know what's possible and they can see the, the different ways out there to reinterpret or reinvent you know our everyday experiences. Right. So and and a lot of students right now are really interested in a bit of genre bending and yeah. And, bringing in a little bit of science fiction or fantasy into realistic fiction. And so it's, it's good to give them up ways, to, ways to see how that might be possible instead of, you know, straight up sci-fi or straight up fantasy, which, you know, is, is, a, is a separate genre that, that I, I don't teach. So, mm -hmm. but I do want them to see that there are ways in which these, these different, you know, these different modes and these different ways of approaching writing and literature can, you know, be friendly and they can cross paths. And so they can see different ways of interpreting reality. Also, I want them to, students to think about experiences that they may not have had themselves. So, you know, a lot of my, because I teach at a Midwestern university, a lot of my students um, are from the Midwest and it's, they, enjoy reading a Midwestern experiences too, like Mrs. Br Mrs. Bridge is a good example. But I also want them to think about, you know, time periods and writers who, you know, are, are not from their own backgrounds at all. So mm -hmm. the idea is for, 
I mentioned in my talk, is uh, a great writer, and his work really resonates with students because even though his world is tends to be pretty different from the ones that my students have, his you know incredible sense of figuring out how how characters you know long for lives that they don't have and um, the way they express their their family troubles that mm -hmm. ends up getting through to the students and then it shows them you know that this guy Juno Diaz who seems so different is actually very similar to them so mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it is really um, it's it's a challenge to <laughs> to to get just the right <laughs> reading list and I'm, I'm never satisfied with it because I always want to you know take the temperature of the room and see what all the students are interested in right now and and then I hope I can find a story or book, you know, just for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's important, right, to show to show flexibility. So no matter how how much energy and effort you put into crafting the the book list, if it's not if it's not meeting them where where they are and, and inspiring them, you you know, you have to be ready to reconsider. So it's another part of why it's so important to keep uh, keep reading, you know, mm -hmm. ourselves, even though we have precious little time for it. Um, Christy Yule sent in a, a question um, that I think a lot of people are probably interested in. Um, she's wondering about adapting um, creative writing methodologies in a composition or um, literature class. And specifically, she says, um, my students write essays, and not all of them like to read or write. Um, I myself am a creative writer, and I'm wondering um, how can I show them the creative side of essay writing? The creative side of, of essay writing. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a question that I have definitely thought about a lot in terms of writing and teaching nonfiction. It's it's so interesting to me because nonfiction is probably the genre that we all read the most. Mm -hmm. it, you know, the just by going on on Facebook or, or Twitter. That is essentially a form of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And yet it's not necessarily understood as, um, as a genre. It's not necessarily something that we teach as much as we teach fiction and poetry writing. But it's, it's really, it, when I teach it, I, I think it's so important because it allows students to really think about the experiences they've had and by reshaping them into some, a, a narrative, they can learn something about who they are and who they want to become. And so mm -hmm. I think one thing I definitely like to encourage my students to do is to approach essay writing as if they were not writing an essay. And I don't, what I mean by that is to use creative techniques while keeping the truth, which is really what creative nonfiction is all about, the creative part of you know, the phrase creative nonfiction is just borrowing the techniques from fiction and poetry and applying them to the true story. So instead of writing, you know, an essay that is, you know, very wooden sounding with, in today's society, you know, third person, everything is like a Wikipedia entry, <laughs> that they, are, they feel free to use the first person and they feel free to have a perspective. Because once you have a perspective, you are able to make an argument. And you know, at the heart of a lot of you know, traditional essay writing, personal essay writing, there, there has to be an argument. There has to be a, a case, a cause, something that you are standing behind. And that comes out of having a subjective perspective, not you know, by giving an, an encyclopedia type of you know, distanced you know, statement mm -hmm. on, on life or society, but saying, well, this is what I think based on the re this particular research I have done and the, re and the experiences I have had. So, you know, bringing in more description, bringing in more remembrances, and, mm -hmm. you know, just allowing students to feel that they can, you know, say what's on their mind and then shape and revise it as opposed to stating something in a very, what they think needs to be a very formal way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a little bit, even a little bit of um, kind of genre bending there too, right? Because they think of 
the essay as this really rigid um, genre with its own impersonal, objective, um, you know, research-oriented um, flavor, and sort of so, sort of encouraging them to see it as more of a hybrid, or you know, or something more flexible that they can actually interact with rather than just like a container that they have to spill their words into and, and shake them up and get them to fall out in the five paragraph, you know, format. Right. I mean, I, I generally see, have seen students just, you know, go numb at the, when you say the word thesis statement. <laughs> it doesn't really excite anybody or, or necessarily, no. it doesn't really motivate anyone to want to write, oh, I have to come up with a dreaded thesis statement, you know, the one or two sentences that sums everything up. I think that's right. actually, uh, I think it's pretty old-fashioned, and I also think it's, it puts a tremendous amount of pressure <laughs> on the writer. Yeah. And I like to think of, you know, I say, you know what, this is more of a process. Just, you'll, you'll eventually come to something that may seem like a thesis statement. But the thing is, you have the space in which you can say what is on your mind, and it's kind of exciting. I, I try to tell the students that this is actually an exciting thing. You can say what's on right. your mind. You don't have to be limited to 60 characters. You know, you can actually just keep going, and you can be interested in what you're looking at. I mean, you should be interested. Find something in this book or something that you have been assigned, and maybe you'll be interested in it, and then start typing, start writing, and see where it takes you. You know, we don't turn, that's why we don't turn in first drafts. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that goes back to um, the the C. Day Lewis um, quote that you introduced earlier: that we do not write in order to be understood; we write in order to understand. So, maybe positioning the essay or the you know the the thesis, you know whatever we mean by that, um, of the essay as something that they're writing toward and and trying to you know use the writing to understand something they're interested in or understand a perspective of theirs, rather than you know that kind of older style of expectation where we, you know, we want them to take a stand and then go out and find the facts that allow them to, to right. justify that stand. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about how that um, kind of applies, you know, in your, in your own writing. You, you have that, you know, you, you have the, the memoir and now the, the novel, and I wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about the difference in, um, in the process. Was there a difference in the process of writing um, the memoir as opposed to the novel? Yes, it's, it is a, a different process because the, the, the narrative revolves in a in nonfiction, the narrative revolves around truth and memory. And that is the foundation. And so mm -hmm. whatever is not clear either has to be said, you know, this isn't clear, I don't remember how, exactly how this happened, but I think, or it can't be included at all. In, in fiction, there's, it's entirely open, so you can mm -hmm. make up everything, which actually can be much more difficult <laughs> than adhering to the, the ground rules of nonfiction. And you'll be able to hear everything. I'll see you know where I am. I'll run here. I'll get any problems and stuff. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Whoa. Close the door. Yeah. Can I put a sign on it? Or? Uh, well, I'm going to grab a sign, actually. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank Yikes. you. Thanks. Wait. Did, you, Yikes. did I just hear no, that? I, Okay. No, no, it's that's not on your end. That was, um, I think, that was uh, the New York office. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Jean, Jean, Jean Pierre's line. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no, um, I wasn't sure if that was just my uh, my own strange phone. <laughs> but, uh, but um, the old party line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the old party line, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I, I I always I think what's what was really exciting for me to to discover in, in writing both nonfiction and fiction is that there's a, a terrific relationship between the two genres, as there mm -hmm. is between nonfiction and poetry. And that mm -hmm. if students can, can be encouraged to write more than one genre, they will learn where each story or subject will take them. So there are stories that I have that are, very, are so true that they would sound ridiculous in fiction. You know, they just sound too unbelievable for fiction, you know, mm -hmm. when you read something and say, oh, that could not possibly happen. That's, it's just too true for fiction. That, that was why I wrote the, the memoir in the first place, because the story that I had, was, it just didn't fit in fiction. It was just simply too true. And so I learned in that way that the material was 
guiding me toward a particular genre. And then all the extra material I had that I wasn't clear enough or didn't really didn't really have a place in nonfiction or I, I wasn't sure what the context would be, that could all be shuttled possibly to a fu future fiction mm -hmm. project. So I think it's about figuring out you know, how to use the material you have. And that's an important point, I think, to make to students, right? Because I think even in a creative writing context, they they often come in thinking, you know, oh, I'm you know, I'm a poet or I'm a short story writer. Very few are coming in thinking, oh, I'm an essayist. But um, but you know, you see that same kind of um, rigidity in um, kind of writerly identities. And and what you're suggesting is that if they um, you know, if, if we all kind of thought more about the material and let the material, um, you know, trigger thoughts about um, genre and expression, um, rather than saying, I'm a fiction writer, therefore I need to turn, you know, these great true stories into some kind of thinly veiled um, fiction. I think we've all read that. <laughs> we read yeah. a lot in the creative writing <laughs> classroom, right? Mostly what, it's mostly what we read. You know, I think there, there's mm -hmm. been for a long time now a an unfair criticism um, thrown at nonfiction, which is, you know, why do you, why do you have anything interesting to say in nonfiction? We almost never hear that in fiction and poetry, but we we, we definitely, I mean, I hear that quite a bit in nonfiction, which is, mm -hmm. oh, you you know, you're you're too young, or you haven't lived life yet, or you haven't, you know, had enough interesting experiences. You know, how can you write in nonfiction at the age of Twenty or thirty, but I, you know, I think that's that's unfair because nonfiction isn't about a transcription of memory. You know, it's not about right. just writing a an A to Z autobiography. That's autobiography. It's about looking back at a particular space in one's life and interpreting it in a meaningful way. I think it's also a genre that could be so useful to undergrads. It's, it's also it's already really useful to graduate students, but to undergrads, in terms of getting them to write about the story that they ought to write about. If, I think that might be one of the most mm -hmm. challenging aspects to a creative writing course, um, which is making sure that students are writing what they need to, to to say, as opposed to you know something that's a little bit more fluffy. Every mm -hmm. everyone has a multitude of stories that are important, you know, emotionally important, that you know have stories that have affected their lives that you know may involve secrets or some kind of unresolved feelings, and and those those are the things that students ought to be writing about, the, the meaningful things, and yeah. and get it when they when they write it in nonfiction, then they're more open to writing it in the other genres as well. So, you know, I think it, that's yeah. one thing that that's, that can be very difficult to, to get across to students in career writing, which is, you know, you guess you can write virtually anything, but you really should probably write the thing that is difficult and close to the bone. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's interesting, too, to think, um, to think of the implications of that for writing you know, in um, classroom spaces other than the space of the creative writing classroom, that that, that really is an insight um, that could be moved into um, basically into any class, you know, get, get students to talk about, you know, to think about what's important to them and to take a perspective and, and to really kind of embrace um, the complexity of themselves. I mean, that, that they are complex individuals with experiences that are worth at least for self-examination and, and directing themselves toward things that really matter to them mm -hmm. instead of, you know, I'm, I'm going to write an essay about capital punishment or let's write an essay <laughs> about, you know, genetically modified food or whatever's, you know, whatever's trendy that they, they think they have to find something to say about that because they haven't been taught to value um, what they bring. And, and you yeah, know, that's right, that everyone has interests. Everyone has their their personal obsessions, and in writing, we d we have to follow those those strange obsessions, and um, that's why I, I do think of the the classroom as a place for permission, where someone 
a text a professor and a fellow student can say, you know, this is interesting. You should write it. You should, right. you know, you should feel free to to keep going with this. And it it, it lot it's it's encouragement and it's sort of a kind of affirmation that you know they're they're seemingly small obsessions um, can really matter. Yeah, and that that kind of affirmation can can matter. You know more than the the grade and the you know the red lining on the paper um, to students even even those who aren't planning to become a writer just having the having their experiences affirmed as valuable that would be a whole different style of um, engagement in some ways so. right because we never know what is what what the thing is you know the creative thing yeah. that we study we never know what's going to stay with us or affect us and I remember you know when I was reading. Um, the New York Times obituary of um, Steve Jobs. He was talking. It was yeah. talking about. It, it wrote about his this calligraphy class that he had taken on a whim. You know, after after leaving college, actually, he took a calligraphy class and you know didn't think it was going to be anything that would affect him. It was just something he was doing because he had nothing better to do and it was fun. But it turned out to be a huge influence in his life in terms of aesthetic and design and, you know, efficiency. And uh, I just thought that was so fascinating because we never know what creative thing we engage in might change us and stay with us forever. Yeah, and, and as you say, you know, a couple at a couple different junctures in your um, presentation, you know, you alluded to the fact that, you know, we can't really know which of, you know, which of our students, you know, is going to, you know, go off in a creative direction. And, and we, we didn't really know that about ourselves, you know, when we were young readers, you know, that there was no way um, to know that we would want to make a life out of reading and writing. But, but those kind of, there were those, those moments of insight and those, um, those moments of instruction and those people offering affirmation and, and offering kind of a model um, for what that, that life could be. And, and so it's, it is interesting to think about you know how we how we all have these paths and and our students have have those paths as well and we can't foresee you know what those paths will be and and neither can they so it's all part of the part of the part of the mystery but part of the responsibility to just keep trying to open as many doors as many books as doors as as we can get them to open mm -hmm. yes definitely and that's you know why I do like that that Ian McEwen quote because I, I don't think that most students, and most students necessarily want to be writers, but I don't think that it's our responsibility to make students into writers. But I do think right. that by, by introducing them to this particular world of writing and literature and creativity and expression, that we do have a chance to make them better, more interesting people who have a greater appreciation for the arts and humanities, and therefore will be able to you know, be a part of that world in some way or support it in some way for the rest of their lives. Yeah, so back to the, back to the original, you know, mission of, of education to, to create an informed and responsible, you know, public citizenry and, and maybe kind of with that additional, you know, creating people who enjoy creating and who can look at themselves as, as a creation in the world and a kind of work in progress. That's, that's a really powerful vision. Yeah, definitely, and um, you know, and I teach at this big university where they're always, you know, using language like synergy and uh, innovation, and nobody really knows what they're talking about. But <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, and they're usually re referencing uh, STEM, you know, the science and technology field. Mm -hmm. But so much of that really begins in in the creative fields, you know, the the, the innovation and thinking about language, thinking about the world from so many different perspectives at once. You know, we need that we need the arts, humanities, and we need the creative world to in order <laughs> for all of us to continue innovating. That's that's a great that's a great note to to end on. And i I'm, I'm so grateful to you for your time today. I know you're at a busy um, and exciting juncture in your own life with the with the new baby. So 
I appreciate even more you taking the time it's, today. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me, and, and I'm definitely happy to answer any questions um, by email too. Okay. Thank you, Bit. We'll send them, an, and I hope um, I hope everyone can stay on. You included Bit for our, our next session with David Pike. He's going to be talking about um, write, uh, world literature in the context of the writing classroom. So some exciting stuff coming up. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.